Hey there, I'm Nyx, and the topic for today's video is going to be solving the duplicate zeros problem on the Leet Code website. Now this is probably going to be a two-parter because during the process of solving this problem I came up with not one, not two, but three different algorithms for it. So I'm going to talk about the first two in this video and leave the third for the next video that I do. As always, I'm going to solve the problem in the C++ language and give you a detailed explanation of the entire process, from the planning stages to the actual coding to the analysis of said code with time complexity and rankings analysis by the websites thrown in. If that sounds good to you, then stay tuned! Welcome back! Let's start taking on this problem. And, <laughs> and all the previous problems, as a side note, call the array nums. But now, for this problem, whenever I call the array by its name, I get to sound like a pirate. <laughs> so, given a fixed length array, r, <laughs> of integers, duplicate each occurrence of zero, shifting the remaining elements to the right. Note that elements beyond the length of the original array are not written, and do the above modifications to the input array in place. Uh, note. Keep in mind that this says that for a little later on into the video. So, the array size doesn't change and we need to duplicate zeros. Now, let's look at this example a little closer for clarification and for planning purposes. So we have an array here. And the first thing we that probably pops into your mind is the uh, intuitive brute force method of doing it. Where we are going to walk through the array and every time we find a zero, we're going to need to iterate through the array in reverse, shifting over each integer that we see to make room for an extra zero to be plopped in at the appropriate place. So we're iterating through the array once to find the position of the zeros, and then we're iterating through it again in reverse, shifting all of the integers we see until we get to that zero. Now doing this indicates that we're going to need a nested loop. Another thing to key into is during this process, you also need to update the index position or else bad things are gonna happen. For example, here, we iterate to this first zero. We iterate back, shifting all of the integers to make room for it. We plop that zero in where it should be for its duplicate. And look what happens if we don't alter the index position. It's still at that initial zero. When the for loop is finished executing and comes back around and iterates that index position up, it's going to move it to that freshly duplicated zero. And the computer's gonna say, oh, hey, I see a zero. Shift everything over plop a zero in the next place in line, and now shift over the position. Oh, hey, another zero, and so on and so forth. If you don't update the index position to shift it and take into account that duplication process you did, you're just gonna fill the entire rest of the ray with zeros, which is not the goal. So with those two pieces of knowledge, let's start coding. Here's going to be the first for loop. Typical one, starting at zero, the beginning of the array. We're gonna go until we get to the end of the array and we're gonna increment up our index position. Next up is the if branch. This looks at our condition, which in this case, if there is a zero at the position that we're looking at in the array, we're gonna wanna do stuff. Within this if statement is going to be the second nested for loop. This is the one that's going to reverse iterate through the array starting from near the end and going all the way to where the position of the zero is. And it's going to shift the integers that it finds one place to the right. The final piece of code to add is the position index adjustment. 
Now you want to add this while you're still within the if statement because you only want to adjust this position if it has found a zero. With the code in place, let's do a run through of the example and see why, for example, j, I set it to array size minus two and why j is going to be greater than or equal to i and why... Explain all the numbers here, essentially. So graphics up. Thank you, Mr. Whiteboard. The array is here. Now, take j. j I've set equal to array size minus two. Well, why did I do that? Well, it's because in this statement here, I want to set the array value at a position that is one higher to whatever the value is at position j. So if I, for instance, started j equaling the last index in this array, which would be array size minus one, remember C++, zero based index, the size is always one higher than the value of the last index. So this would be array size minus one. But if I set j equal to that, then when it tries to execute this code, j plus one set equal to j, it's going to see this is position j, this value is r j, and when it goes to try to set the value at position j plus one, it tries to do something that is out of bounds and beyond the end of the array which is bad, it will result in much red text and compiler screaming at me. To avoid that, I would need to set j equal to the position array size minus two. So instead of the last index value, I'm setting it to the next last. When it goes to set this position's value to whatever this one is, it'll work because it's still within the boundaries of the array. It's going to do that all the way until it gets to when j is greater than or equal to i. So when j is equal to i, it's at the position where the zero is. And it's going to set that position via this code to that position as well, which is exactly what I want. It's going to create another zero from thin air. All right, let's now run this code and see what happens finished we have the thing these two answers match good so far let's click more buttons accepted Woohoo! again before we check out this more details button let's do a little bit of time complexity analysis this one is uh, fairly straightforward all we really have here is essentially a nested for loop. And nested for loops, when you're iterating through an array and you're in the process of iterating through it, you're iterating through it in a different way, that is going to result in a time complexity that's equal to big O of n squared. Because both this for loop and this for loop depend on how big the array size is. As the array size gets bigger, these for loops are gonna take longer to execute. So the time complexity is big O of n squared, which isn't the best. It's very good for memory usage, however, as it's not cr using any additional containers, it's not using any new variables, except temporary ones that the for loops use. So that's that's a good part about in-place algorithms. They might not necessarily have good time complexities, but their space complexity and their memory usage is uh, pretty good. So let's see what the details are. Mm -hmm. With brute force methods, big O of n squares, not the best solution to this. Definitely ways to optimize it as you see up here, it will be not the best in terms of time complexity. In terms of space complexity, 
pretty decent, and again, as always, take these with a gram of salt. But when I see distributions like this, this is a good indicator that multiple types of solutions exist, ones that have worse time complexity, and others that have better solutions. The uh, third algorithm that will be the subject for the next video I create has a better time complexity, so it'll be boosted up here. Now, speaking of said other algorithms, during the process of optimizing this problem and seeing the general idea of how to take it from a big O of n squared to a big O of n solution, trying to solve the problem without having those that nested for loop here, I was working on that algorithm and to, trying to work through some edge cases that were resulting in wrong answers and horrible red text, and so on and so forth. And during that process, I was curious as to what this first hint was going to be. I figured it was going to be something along the lines of hinting toward that nested for loop solution here. And I don't know what the hint 2, 3, or 4 say, because I didn't click on those. But I was curious if this was going to go straight toward helping out toward optimizing that more optimized time complexity solution that I was thinking of and running into some issues with test cases. So upon clicking this, reading it, great introductory yada 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 yada, the problem clearly states that we are to modify the array in place. Yeah! That does not mean we cannot use another array. So my train of thought promptly got completely derailed <laughs> upon reading this. And instead of working on the other array, I immediately wanted to make an algorithm that this hint alluded to, because I wanted to see if loot code actually would accept it. So let's quickly take a look at that, bringing up some graphics examples and uh, stick an example array up there. Now, if this is our original array, and we can make a new array, then duplicating the zeros is going to be fairly simple to do. You just copy over everything that isn't a zero, and then when something is, you wanna essentially copy it over twice, making sure that you still have enough room for it. In other words, you don't want to run into this scenario with this example array where we have one, two, three, and zero at the end, we're adding each over into the array. Once we've added three and we're looking to add zero, we still have space for one of the zeros, but the other one, if we were to duplicate it, would again have an out of bounds error. You're trying to access memory that doesn't belong to you, compiler freak out. So we want to make sure to avoid that. So two things to jump out at me for this, need to create an array, and we need to keep track of how much space we have to fill in our array. So let's get this reset to default, and let's try this again, shall we? All right, here are the two variables, making a new vector of integers, and I'm calling it dupe zero array and I'm making an integer variable that I'm simply calling counter and setting that equal to zero. We need to iterate through the original array and see what's there. So start at the beginning, i is equal to zero. And in this case, the condition we want to use is going to be until we run out of space in the new array. So in other words, as long as this counter is less than the array size. First thing I do is add an if statement. So if I'm going through the array and I see a value that isn't equal to zero, all I'm gonna do is add it to the new array and I'm gonna increase the counter. Next up is the other condition. So if we've run into a zero in the array, well, we want to add that to the new array. We want to increase the counter by one again. 
but we also want to duplicate it. So we need to, to do this again within yet another if statement, like so. This is going to double check whether we still have room to add the duplicated zero here. In other words, if the counter is still less than the original array's size, then we can go ahead and add the zero again, push back another one, and then increase the counter. This guards against the risk of creating an out of bounds scenario compiler error. The last bit of code to add is outside of this for loop, we want to set our original array equal to this new array. And with that, this code should be good to go. Let's see that. Run code. No, okay, no horrifying red text. Now, submit, pending, judging, and it is indeed accepted. What confuses me about this is way back up here when we were reading the problem statement, it specifically said to do the above modifications to the input array in place. And as I understand that term in the strictest sense, it means you can't really use other additional containers and carve out additional memory. If I was in a technical interview setting and the interviewer is saying, hey, great algorithm you came up with, but can you find an in-place solution if the algorithm I came up with wasn't? It wouldn't occur to me to hear in place as saying, oh, okay, I can go ahead and create new containers and carve out that additional memory space for that. So I, I, was, I was confused, I was extremely confused. <laughs> However, looking at this array, let's do some analysis time on it. It does have a steeper memory requirement than the nested for loop solution, the big O of n squared time complexity solution that we did previously. But as a benefit, you're only using one for loop, its time complexity is only big O of n. So it's kind of a trade-off. If I was being asked, compare this algorithm to that nested for loop algorithm, which one is the better one? My answer would be, it depends on what you want to use the algorithm for. Do you want to pay special attention to getting the best possible time complexity you can? In this case, this algorithm would be better because it's only big O of n time complexity as opposed to n squared. However, if you want to optimize your memory usage and minimize the memory that you want to utilize, this would be a worse algorithm to use compared to the alternative because you're creating a new vector. And although it might be temporary space, it's still memory space. What would be best is if you can get a big O of n time complexity with essentially big O of one space complexity and have the best of both worlds. And that is what I'm going to try in the next video. So if you're curious about that, the video will be up shortly. But before we end, let's just go ahead and see. <laughs> yeah, time complexity, you know, as a big O of N solution, it is boosted up here instead of down here. That makes sense. But uh, accordingly, the memory usage sucks, which is not surprising. Those were the first two algorithms that I successfully created. The third one is more involved and needs to keep in mind several specific test cases. So as a result of that, and because I don't want to make like an hour long video, I'm going to leave that for part two, which will be uploaded in a few days. Well, I hope this video was useful for you in some way, and thank you very much for watching. As always, happy coding and have a nice day.